Welcome to Iceland. My name is Mary Frances Davidson. And my name is Julie Ingham, and we work for the UNESCO GROW Fisheries Training Programme. In this video series, we will be exploring Sustainable Development Goal 14. Sustainable Development Goal 14 relates to life in water and how we can build a path toward conserving living aquatic resources in our oceans and seas. There are 10 targets within SDG 14 and five of them deal with fisheries and how humans can use the living aquatic resources to build the future we want. SDG 14 deals with interactions between humans and aquatic ecosystems. All over the world, people rely on these systems to provide them with food, income, livelihoods, and not to mention ecosystem services like regulation of the global climate. In this way, as we work together towards achieving the targets of SDG 14, we are also considering the other sustainable development goals, including ending poverty, ending hunger, good health, quality education, and of course, climate change. For over 20 years, the fisheries training program in Iceland has been working toward building capacity in developing countries to sustainably manage living aquatic resources. Through training and research, we've worked all over the world. We've trained over 400 fisheries professionals, working with research institutions, universities, and government agencies in developing countries. In this SDG 14 video series, we explore some of the major issues facing the development of fisheries across the world today. At the end of this video, we post some questions, which we hope will help you reflect on the fisheries where you live and what might be needed to address the targets of Sustainable Development Goal 14. Let's focus now on the second half of SDG Target 14.4, which asks us to implement science-based management plans to restore fish stocks to maximum sustainable yield as determined by their biological characteristics in the shortest time feasible. Now, a generation ago, 90% of the fish stocks we harvested came from sustainably sourced stocks. Today, the number is closer to 66%. Now to achieve target 14.4 and restore fish stocks to MSY, we need information about those stocks. But how do we actually know what's going on with the fish stocks we want to harvest? Einar Hjörlöfsson is a fisheries biologist with the Marine and Freshwater Research Institute in Iceland. And he's going to talk through a fundamental fisheries equation to help us solve this problem. So Einar, welcome. It's always fascinated me the, the uh, the job of a fisheries scientist, because nothing in the world that we harvest behaves quite like fisheries. You know, they're, they're wild stocks. They can be harvested at a way that, that uh, is infinite if we manage it properly because it regenerates. These, these stocks are always growing and we could actually have an infinitely sustainable food source if we manage it properly. And that's where the role of the fisheries scientist comes in. So, uh, fundamentally, if you would look at the job of a fisheries scientist, what are you trying to do? My grandchildren ask that. <laughs> and I say, I count fish. And they don't ask any further. They understand <laughs> it. In the, yeah. that, uh, in the sense that if, you, if, you, if your child or grandchild asks you, well, what does a lawyer do? It's a very difficult thing to answer. But to a kid, if you say, I'm counting fish. No further question. The problem is the kid thinks about uh, counting fish like counting uh, trees. Uh, the problem that the kid doesn't understand is that counting fish is not the same as counting trees because fish are invisible, they move, and then they eat each other. And that's, uh, that's a, bit, a bit of a Difficult not to crack them, and it's not, not as easy as the kid thinks. So, Einar, given the tools that are available for a fishery scientist to determine MSY, for instance, if we're going to implement actual science-based management to restore MSY, 
Where would you start? What is the, the fundamental equation in fisheries that we can use to guide us towards MSY? In this context, the, the fundamental uh, equation or relationship we have is that the catch is a function of the fishing mortality mm -hmm. uh, times the biomass. Mm. And then this links then to these issues of the uh, maximum sustainable yield in the form that catch is more or less maximum sustainable yield. It's, yeah. the, same, it's the same element, it's just mm -hmm. a, a, a different measure. Uh, the fishing mortality itself is linked to the, to the maximum sustainable yield. The, the, it's related to the fishing mortality that if we exert it, gives us the maximum sustainable yield. And the biomass in the, in the fundamental catch equation is also then related to this concept of that there's some kind of a maximum biomass that results in maximum sustainable yield. Mm -hmm. So we can think about this as catch is equal to fishing mortality times biomass, mm -hmm. MSY is equal to FMSY mm -hmm. times BMSY. So they're linked in that sense. So let's dissect this fundamental fisheries equation a little bit more. When you mention fishing mortality, how do we figure out what fishing mortality is or should be? What goes into that calculation? Well, you can think about uh, fishing mortality as the proportion of the biomass that we take out that constitutes the catch. Mm. But fishing mortality can be split into two components. One is the effort, which is sort of uh, the issue of how much, it's a sort of like how many days out at sea or boat days do I have in a certain fishery that is fishing in a certain stock. The measurement that we use or a unit of, of fishing effort, it can be number of boats, it can be days out at sea in terms of boats, yeah. or it can be hours trawled. The unit that is used just depends on what kind of a data we have. The other element of the fishing mortality is what is called the catchability. Mm. Now catchability is, is not the question of how much, but how do we fish. You can think about that in the context of the size is we need to answer the question also when it comes to the maximum sustainable yield is that should we fish the small fish or should we ban it? Should we only fish the large fish and ban fishing small fish? And these are fundamental parts of the maximum sustainable yield but it's not described whether how we achieve that thing in terms of when it comes to catchability. Mm -hmm. But in short, fishing mortality in a sense when it comes to management is this component, one compo is these two components is basically catchability which is basically related to gear and then the effort that is related to how many boats are out there mm -hmm. or how many gears you deploy, deploy. So in one sense we have uh, we have not only the maximum sustainable yield concept mm -hmm. and the FMSY concept, but we have the e effort MSY concept mm -hmm. and even the catchability MSY concept. Mm -hmm. And it's not straightforward. This is not a single number that we can extract mm -hmm. because we need to think about, well, of the various sectors in the fisheries, how should I then split up the MSY towards these various sectors? And these things cannot be answered just using a simple, of li small, uh, using uh, limited data and simple models. We need to think further and deeper into this issue uh, if we want to really achieve some kind of a sustainability. And I'm not only thinking about the sustainability of silver catch, but the sustainability of the community that is relying on this catch. Catchability is a complicated term complicated variable in, in this equation. Um, can you describe how catchability is determined and how the nature of the fishery affects 
what terms you would use to describe the catchability? The in theoretically, catchability is just a, a unit of effort exerted by un the, the. It's just the fishing mortality exerted by one unit of uh, effort. So it's like a. It's a fishing mortality by one fisherman going out there one day. And if he catches two kilos of fish, we can imagine that. That this catchability must be a very, very low number. That can't be a high fishing mortality because there must be a lot of fish out there. Mm -hmm. And two kilos is nothing, relatively speaking. But the catchability issue becomes important here because in terms of management, we need to think about how we fish. Is it, are we, are we allowed, and we can think, we, yeah, how we, fi we can think about how we fish. We can fish, we can get the same catch from two different uh, uh, fishing uh, patterns. We can have many guys with low catchability, meaning low efficiency, uh, f get the same amount of catch as few boats with a high efficiency, high catchability, they could bring out in or on shore the same amount of catch. So it's a distribution that also needs to be taken into account here. Mm -hmm. And that is not written in, in, in the textbooks of mm -hmm. how to achieve FMSY. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a question that the society needs to answer and address. Fishery science might help uh, to address those uh, questions. And in a sense, they're all written in the end in the fundamental fisheries equation. It's just a matter of how we apply them that sometimes becomes a question. And that mm. is not a model that can answer that question directly. Mm. We have to interfere here in, in the model itself. Mm. So next, I'd like to move to talking more about data, because clearly, um, all of the variables that come to make the fundamental fisheries equation require a lot of information that's maybe not very easy to collect. And what I want to ask to begin with is, in your experience working for the Grow Fisheries Training Program, you've been all over the world and you've worked with all kinds of data sets. So in your estimation, what, what is uh, needed? What kind of data collection is needed? What kind of data storage is needed? How would you encourage developing countries, for instance, to collect and manage data to answer these fundamental questions? Well, if we leave aside what data is collected uh, for the time being, mm -hmm. uh, th th because a lot of data is collected, what I've uh, come across in my uh, traveling around uh, various countries is that the data is there, but it's not really easily accessible. It could be even on paper form. These are valuable data that should be preserved by all means. They should be made available elect into in electronic format, so we can uh, immediately sort of go, a go ahead and analyze them, rather than wasting all our time or spending a lot of our time in uh, entering the data. Uh, then we have data that is already entered and is electronically available, but their format is in such a way that it requires a lot of work to make them available uh, to do the actual analysis itself. My uh, experience is that uh, the best way to store data is through a database system. If we have a database system, we can, can be ensured that the data is in the right format for immediate analysis. Mm -hmm. But one of the problems that I've come across that even when data are in a database, uh, people uh, find it hard to even get the data out. It's sort of kind of like if the data gets into a database, it's almost like equivalent to being a lost data to some people. So we need to, we need to have the capacity uh, within the fishery science in each country of 
not only getting the data in a, to a proper format, uh, like in form of a database, but more importantly, even to get uh, to get the a capacity or have the capacity to get the data out mm -hmm. of the whatever data st uh, storage medium we have, mm -hmm. and often this problem is there is the ninety percent problem of uh, trying to do any kind of a data analysis. Mm -hmm. Once we have the data in that format, that's only 10% uh, left uh, mm -hmm. for, for the job of, of seeing, for the job with respect to extracting as much information out of the data as we, we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds from what you're saying like there, uh, there's a lot of data collection going on in marine science and fisheries science all over the world. The biggest problem maybe is that the data isn't stored in a way that it's easy to access. And it also, even when it is stored in a database, for instance, uh, the human capacity to access and work with the data doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, then the data might, the type of data that has been collected, even though it's stored in a properly format, mm -hmm is often uh, too limited in order to answer the fundamental equations of, of, of figuring out whether we are fishing something at a close to maximum sustainable yield. Um, as I said earlier, we of often have possibly only information about the total catch. We may have information about the effort. We may have some information about the area that is fished. We don't know sometimes the size composition of the catch. And to me, to solve this riddle, catch alone is really uh, a measure that on its own is really not sufficient to obtain the answer of estimations of the status of the fisheries relative to the, the goal of, of maximum sustainable yield. And I reiterate again that I think one of the key additional measures that is needed is uh, some kind of a measure of the size composition of the catch. Mm -hmm. It does not solve everything. We still have assumptions uh, if we feed these data into an assessment model, but it takes us a long way. And I, as I often sort of think about these things, me coming from a very data-rich world, is that if the data is poor, the output from any kind of an analytical assessment model is assumption-driven. If the data is rich, one might not even need a model. Mm. Ideally, that's where, where we would uh, like to go to. Mm. And we need... Uh, somehow to achieve that, to go from a data-limited situation to a more data-rich situation, going from models to possibly just empirical uh, analysis of the data itself in terms of time series, mm -hmm. in order to deduce uh, what is the status of our fisheries, the status of our stocks relative to the ultimate goal, which is fish sensibly, as I would like to call it, rather than achieving the elusive FMSY goal. Mm. That is uh, a very ambitious uh, undertaking mm. that I think can only rarely be really achieved uh, if you have more or less measure of all the things that are happening out there in nature. That is not only the cats that we take out in terms of fisheries, we need also to think about, well, there's a growth as well happening at the same time. The, the fish that are still out there, they're growing. Do we get an estimate of those? Do we have an estimate of those? There are, the fish gets eaten. How do we quantify that volume, value? Uh, and then we have, of course, recruitments coming in at any one time period. How do we quantify this value? It's totally impossible in its own self. So what I'm saying is, yes, more data doesn't get us away from having some assumptions, 
but these assumptions that we need to make if the data is a little bit better than just having cuts alone become then less critical when it comes to, to, to the derivation of the results uh, from an assessment model. So I just want to ask one more wrap-up question, uh, taking us back to where we began with SDG 14.4 and the implementation of science-based management plans. Now we've gone over the fundamental fisheries equation, the problems with the calculation of the different variables, and also explored issues of data management and data storage and accessing data from databases. If we're going to implement science-based management plans to restore fish stocks, um, what do you think are the, the very first things, uh, especially in developing countries, that we need right now to be focused on to achieve this target? The first thing is store the data that you already have. Make sure they're preserved. They are of value. Even though they are possibly limited, they're still of value. At least they tell us about uh, something about the fundamental uh, element we need, and that is what has been removed out in terms of fisheries, in terms of the catch. They have that. The second aspect that I think is um, critical, and that is capacity building. To educate the fishery scientists within those countries, uh, educate them in the sense that not only educate them about the stock assessment models and what date, different kinds of data are needed, but educate them first and foremost about the various assumptions that are really made in, in these analytical models. So they become critical. I say this because um, I've been in uh, situations where you have a consultant coming in. The consultant says, okay, well, you know, what's the question? What data do you have? And then the consultant goes into his corner and he does his analysis. And he comes out with the FMSY for wild care. But the recipient of that has not a fundamental clue about the assumption that is made. He doesn't have the capacity to critically evaluate what was being made by the consultant. But he is still the guy that is in stock with delivering this to the manager and defend this kind of a calculation. And if you don't have the capacity to critically review what comes uh, critically review the re outcomes from consultant work or, or some kind of an analytical model that somebody makes, uh, you, you, we are no better off. We, we might as well just forget it. And in the meantime, just focus on uh, collecting more and better data and store them and, and wait until uh, we have the capacity to, to deal with them properly within our own countries. Well, Einar, thank you so much for this conversation. It was really illuminating. Thank you very much. Dr. Einar Hjörlesen took us through some of the science and math behind the analysis of fish stocks. If we are to prevent overfishing, and manage fisheries using science, as outlined in SDG 14.4, we need better information. What kind of statistics are collected in your fisheries? How are fishery statistics used in fisheries management in your country? What is the level of competency within your country to analyse the available fisheries data and in which areas do you need strengthening?